Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with John Miller of BGM Knives. In a short time, John has carved out a niche and made a name in the EDC fixed blade arena. His wide range of models, materials, and blade grinds really stood out to me when I first, uh, when his work first caught my eye on Instagram. Uh, whether working from his own designs or models uh, that are fully custom from customers and uh, to, to their specs, John's work is clean and impeccable and gets the endorsement of some really uh, trusted followers of this show. So I'm excited to find out more and, you know, uh, start thinking about which knife I'm going to order. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell and share this video if you're watching it on YouTube. Also, while you're there, check out our other shows. We have knife review videos, Thursday Night Knives, our live stream and our Knife Junkie Town Halls where you can meet and talk to knife makers and personalities you know and love. If you want to support the show, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to get there is thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Hey, John, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. How Thank you, doing? you for having me. Ah, it's a pleasure. So you're a young man in an old man's industry. And I don't mean old man's industry, but, you know, knives being the oldest tools around. Sure. Uh, yeah, it was kind of surprising to see your work, see your body of work on Instagram and then discover you have just started out. Yeah, I started when I was uh, 17, almost 18. Um, I worked at a construction site with my uncle at the time. And uh, I put put some home, uh, got some steel, and I uh, just carved it out. It was like mild steel, so it was pretty junk. But uh, that was the first thing that I did. First so, thing. so it was a stock reduction kind of knife. Yeah, I've always done stock removal. I have forged a couple knives, but uh, they didn't really turn out super great. <laughs> well, that takes time. Well, so how yeah. did you? Uh, so. You're on this construction site, your uncle's construction yes. site. You see some mild steel, and your thought is, I'll turn this into a knife. It Why? started with YouTube. Started. Uh, <laughs> DB Blaze, specifically, an Australian knife maker. Huh. And uh, he just made it seem super approachable, and uh, it seemed like I could do it. And I, I always loved knives. Um, since I can't, I'm probably like four or six, I was always carrying a knife. So uh, it was natural progression, basically. So six years old, carrying a knife. Don't tell my daughter that. She'll, <laughs> she'll start to insist. Yeah. So uh, how did you get this love of knives? What instilled it in you? It's uh, natural. I, I don't know what to say. I, I've, like I said, I've always been into it. My dad wasn't super into it, but um, it just seems natural to, to be, uh, for me to want, you know, like knives. And, uh, you know, making them is pretty much just the next step. Yeah, well, I mean, I think most people listening would agree with you that it is natural. It seems natural. A lot of people say uh, their grandfather gave them their first knife. That was definitely uh, my, you know, my first first knife I had was from my grandfather. But for me, it was also movies. You know, I grew up um, I grew up in the 80s and sure. 90s and uh that was the fertile rambo time yeah sure time yeah and uh yeah that that really did it to me so what was this first knife like that you made i wish i had it um i think i do have it somewhere but it was a uh, tanto uh it had a paracord wrap it wasn't hardened or anything it was just a soft paracord wrap uh that was the japanese style with the crisscross pattern to it and uh, it was like flat convex grinders. I did it on uh, one of those bench grinders with a stone wheel. So it's nothing special. But, uh, yeah. Actually, it is something special because it's, <laughs> <your very> <laughs> it's your very first your very first knife. Yeah. So uh, what, what's what's the inspiration there? You said kind of like a Japanese knife. 
like a tanto and it also had the cord wrap what what's you know what are the kind of knives it that was draw yeah, you that that particular one was modeled after a uh, miller uh Bros blades knife one of their models it was similar to one of their things but uh yeah yeah miller brothers if you if you're not familiar they make some really um chunky beefy brutal yeah. looking knives yeah I have a tomahawk from them, and I had a couple of uh, fixed blades too. They're expensive too. Okay, so you're a, you're a collector too, then? I was, yeah. I don't really buy any knives anymore. I've been carrying a fixed blade for at least six months, so I kind of weeded out the folders. Okay, so EDC fixed blades—that's that's, that's kind of your your niche, as I mentioned up yep. front. Well, why that? And and uh, you know, you know, like, uh, how do you fit? Uh, a fixed blade into your everyday carry? I'm used to carrying a lot of stuff. Um, it was, this is my spade model. Oh, push uh, that they're up pretty to the small. Camera. This one's all beat up because it's my uh, user. It's got G10 scales, a hollow grind. Uh, it's pretty thin on the edge, but you can't see that too well. Uh, but yeah, they're pretty small. So, uh, but I just, the concept is I wanted to eliminate uh, all the parts that could fail in a folder, uh, get out of alignment, screws coming loose. I wanted to take away all that and have something that I could rely on no matter what happened uh, for EDC specifically. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned YouTube as a big yes. uh, influencer, the, the part, uh, the thing, the element in your life that really uh, got you involved. Did you self-teach yourself uh from videos you saw on you know how-to videos on youtube it was not not exactly really it was more just watching gb blades if you know his format uh video style it's not very like uh it's not made for people that are making knives it's more for just a general audience although he does go into some detail a general detail and that's kind of how i i got into it and uh for once I upgraded to the more advanced steels, then I went on forums and, you know, looked for heat treats and different stuff with cryo and all that stuff. Do you think that YouTube is a place or social media in general, but especially YouTube because it's king, uh, the king of video. Do you think that that is that me, for instance, that I could just hop on there and after doing some studying, um, do you think I could be an effective knife maker first time out? Like how did, how do you think that works? I, I think you definitely could. I think anyone can. Uh, I mean, I did it. I had very little previous skill. I'm not really uh, that inclined with tools or anything like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, you know open to a wide variety of people. Uh, are you also are you creative in in other ways? <laughs> not really. I suck at <laughs> like drawing and all that type of stuff. Uh, art. I'm not good at that. Um, well, actually, I got I'm news for you. Person. You're a sculptor, actually. It, it it turns out, and you didn't even know it because, um, well, that's what sculpture is, right? It's like taking a piece of something, whether Stop it's a removal, big yeah. chunk of Basically. marble, or or what have you, and you're removing stuff away from it that's not a knife, or that's not a, a sculpture of David, or or whatever. And even if you're forging, you're doing the same thing. You're taking a lump of something, and uh, so don't say you're not artistic. You are artistic, sir. <laughs> a little bit, I guess. All right. So, uh, so fixed blade knives. I, I go, um, you know, the name of the channel is knife junkie and, and I mean it quite literally, like, uh, it's hard for me to stay, um, immersed in one area of excitement when it comes to knives. You can see the swords behind me. I love all sorts of folders. I love all sorts of fixed blades and I go through these cycles and, sure. uh, you caught my eye, uh, your work caught my eye during, uh, a recent and well, it's kind of continuous EDC fixed blade phase because I'm constantly trying to incorporate fixed blades into my very uh, suburban lifestyle. You know, it's not it's yeah. not necessarily easy. Yeah, um, no, it can be definitely be difficult. So, so what what what, what are your yeah what are your considerations when you're designing and coming up with something? Uh, that's why I always plan to offer full customs because. In, I think, California, there's a three-inch blade limit, if I'm uh, correct on that. Some places, there's definitely three-inch blade limits. So I always offer custom. So if you want to shrink a model, I can always do that. 
Uh, normally, most of my designs run around eight inches overall, a little bit below that. Um, to and this that's what worked for me with this spade. This is the I've been carrying this particular knife for at least eight months, I think, since I was still in New York. I made this one, and uh, you know it's not super big, it's not super uh, small. It's an in between that I can comfortably carry uh, for me personally. How do you but carry I that? Through, uh, I carry it vertically with a uh, paracord on my belt. Oh, okay. So I loop. I can show you. <laughs> Take on my belt. This is where it is. Oh, and the right paracord on. runs through. It's very simple. And uh, I'm just trying to minimize everything that could fail potentially. So yeah. I just got a you know, little knot at the end. And that's pretty much it. So you were you were in New York. You're in New Hampshire right now, but you were in New York before. What's it like uh, making knives in New York? It's kind of a restrictive place, isn't it? Uh, you know, it's not as bad as you would think. Uh, in New York City is really bad. Right. But just generally speaking, uh, New York is not crazy. Uh, it's not. It's no New Hampshire where there is no knife laws. You can carry whatever you want in New Hampshire, <laughs> uh, which is awesome. But uh, yeah, it's not too bad. Um, yeah, yeah, I moved up to uh, New Hampshire in uh, September, late September, uh, okay. two thousand twenty. Uh, not to get not to get too personal, but were you following the knife laws? Is that did you decide that BGM would be a great? Uh, it would be a great idea to locate there, so you wouldn't have to worry about any of that stuff. Uh, that was part of the more the biggest reason why I wanted to move to New Hampshire uh, was because of the uh, there's no sale ta sales tax mm -hmm. and there's uh, no income tax. So that's a huge plus, obviously. And on your that's license plate, it things. says live free or die, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, got that right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I like it. New Hampshire's looking better every day. Yeah, it's nice. So uh, I want to talk more about the the concept of the fixed blade, um, uh, the the EDC fixed blade, and how it can fit into uh, your average Joe's or or Jones lifestyle. Uh, Joan has it easier because she's got a purse or a bag that she carries probably more often than your average Joe. But I run into problems. Okay, all winter long I was carrying an EDC fixed blade. To me. Uh, uh, I, I prefer a blade that's four inches, uh, maybe even north of that if possible, if it's in my waistband. I can I like I like uh, certain kind of little shiv type things in my pocket, but my main consideration is handle size because sure. sitting down in the car, you know, get the poke in the ribs yeah. or yeah. or um, or that kind of thing. Um, so it, the the real the real impressive thing to me is to to base everything on an EDC fixed blade. Um, is there a, is there a, a residing philosophy? Do you have an overarching philosophy about your designs and about, uh, the, the, the purpose of these knives? I always try to go smaller because, uh, you know, you go bigger, but if it's not on you, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? If you can't grab the thing on your side, then it's worthless. So if you're not comfortable with a bigger, uh, you know, size knife with blade or handle, just go smaller and, uh, you know, the most important thing is that you always have it on you. Right, right. They say the best knife is the one you have on yep. you at the time. Yeah, at that goes with anything, multi-tools, firearms, if you carry one. Right, right. So tell me a little bit about your process in your shop. What, uh, is this a full-time uh, gig for you, or uh, how does that work for you? It is full-time. I'm uh, living at my mom's house, uh, mom and dad's house. Um so that's covering that. I would never be able to do this without them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm saving up for a shop slash house right now. New Hampshire, it's you know pretty reasonable to get something uh, for not too much, and you know there's taxes and too much, and it's easy to live here essentially. But uh, yes, it is full time. I'm okay, not, so you know, I don't have all the responsibilities of a normal adult. Right. Well, those will come. <laughs> they, yeah, they, they don't stay away for too long. But yeah. uh, I, I got to say, you know, you it seems like you've got a vision. You'll 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 be uh, you'll be ready for those when they come. But tell me about your your process and um, how you go about uh, your day making knives um, and, and and, you know, working this as a business. So, yeah, it's pretty, uh, you know, bootleg. But um, 
generally I do around 12 to 10 knives every seven days. Each day I designate a process. So today, for instance, I cut out the designs and I um, drill the holes for the handles and the choils and stuff like that. Tomorrow will be a grind day. And then after that, I'll be doing the treat and so on. So each day is designated and I have my work set out for that day. So how many knives can you, pro you said today was like a profiling day. You cut out the yep. blade, you put the holes in it or uh, yeah, for the, uh, the handles so that yep. you don't have to do that when it's heat treated. Uh, yeah. oh, that, that dagger, we'll get back to that dagger in the middle there. That's pretty sweet. Um, so how many of those can you knock out in one day? How many blades can you profile in one day? In one day, I think the most I've ever done was around 30, but that wasn't a full day. Um, it's just all spending all day on the bandsaw. Um, I've kind of switched it up. Sometimes I switch it up because if I get bored, um, you know, I'm up here alone in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my family's still in New York, so uh, I definitely get bored sometimes. So I'll switch up the process a little bit to keep it a little interesting. And uh, yeah. Well, yeah, you don't want to get bored when you're when you're working with a bandsaw. But that's what I was going to ask yeah. you, like, yeah, uh, the the bandsaw. So that's how you're doing it. You just cut it out of the steel, and uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, some models are water jet cut. Um, the Quakens usually are if they're in the cheaper steels. I get those water jet. Some of the Tomahawks are water jet. Uh, most stuff is cut out by me with the bandsaw, a portable bandsaw that I, you know, get a ghetto mounted it to the wall. <laughs> what uh, pushed into it. Why do you uh, do the water jet on on the Quaken? The Quaken, by the way, uh, before you continue, is my favorite of your models so far, um, of your it's standard models. Is it? Yep. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's it, it's yeah it, it's, it's very cheap. I used to sell those for 130 bucks uh, in the base steel. Uh, now that's bumped up to 160 bucks, I think. Hmm. Yeah, 160 in the base steel. So I've, you know, my prices have gone up as I've, you know, taken on more responsibilities, having to feed myself and, you know, other stuff too. Like, <laughs> Man, so, but hopefully they don't, yes. I'm sorry, continue. I keep interrupting you. Go ahead. Uh, hopefully they uh, don't increase too much more because the, the whole point is to keep, you know, custom knives affordable to, you know, to me back when I was 17, if I wanted to get a custom knife that if I saved up for a little bit, I would be able to do it uh, reasonably. And not have to save up for months. Well, I, I got to say, that price is not going to last because people are going to start flooding you once they catch wind, and uh, you're going to have to jack those prices up. But I mean, that's that's a really cool philosophy uh, coming from someone who's uh, kind of got constantly has knives coming in, and and I don't have as many knives going out as I'd <laughs> as I, sure. as as I should. Uh, be selling or trading, but uh, to have a fully customized knife uh, of a design, you know, of that design uh, coming in for that price is a real, man, that's a real boon to the market. And uh, I think, I think people are going to respond to that. So far, it's been incredibly positive and uh, I can't thank my customers enough. Is it all, um, Instagram, how, how do you get the word out and how do people know your stuff? All advertisement is pretty much Instagram and I've gone to a couple nice shows in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, so that's pretty much it. I do have a YouTube channel, but it, it doesn't, you know, hasn't taken a lot, of, hasn't gotten a lot of traction, but uh, it is there for some people and some people have come from that. Uh, some other advertisement is uh, from uh, Bearded Gear. I don't know if you know about him. Oh, He's yeah. A YouTuber. Oh, and uh I've sent, uh, he bought a knife for me and I've sent him a couple of knives for uh, giveaways and stuff like that. That's and uh, to grow my Instagram, uh, what was really helpful was giving knives to people to run their own giveaways on bigger uh, profiles to, you know, generate uh, lots of followers and, you know, traffic on my page. Well, as we sit here and uh, Jim is scrolling through your models, um, you know, something that becomes readily apparent. Jim, actually, if you could hold it there for a second, you can see um, you can see hollow grinds. You can see compound grinds. You can see just off the page a fully flat ground blade. Uh, I know that you do chisel grinds. Uh, what? 
this I mentioned this up front. I mean, you have a such a broad range of what you offer. Uh, it seems a little, um, I don't know, unbelievable. I was like, really? He does thin hollow grinds too, you know? Uh, tell me about that. What, what is your philosophy in offering all of this, uh, all of this, all these different grinds and such? I mean, that's just, in my opinion, part of, you know, offering custom. A lot of people uh, that gain traction, uh, that start off making customs, they'll stop doing customs because honestly, it, it can be a pain in the ass, especially when customers uh, back out and don't pay for their, you know, the product you're making them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, n normally, uh, it's all part of the part of the job. It's part of the customs just to offer the, all the different types of grinds and stuff. It's the trying to make the best experience for the customer. I'm, I'm, I'm under the, I guess maybe false impression that doing a hollow grind is much more difficult than a flat grind. Doing a fully flat ground is more difficult than, you know, it, it, it seems like you approach them all equally. It's, it's really to however, like whatever you start on, you just get the most used to it. So for me, a normal hollow grind is the easiest. Compound grinds are the hardest because there's six different grinds, three on each side, normally. Uh, full flats aren't that bad. Uh, something that I stopped offering because it doesn't really make sense and I have a really hard time doing them are saber grinds. Hmm. They, um, they're just really hard for me. Um, that has to do a little bit with my equipment and then my skill set, which is, isn't you know the greatest. Uh, explain, describe to uh, listeners and viewers what a saber grind is. So a saber grind is a full flat grind, but that doesn't go all the way to the spine. So from the looks of it, just like this, if this was flat ground, this would be a saber grind. And then a full flat would, the whole grind would encompass the whole blade. So it'd be like a straight line at the uh, Ricasso or whatever they call that. Right, right. Instead of having that concave surface, what what is yep. the what do you think the benefit of a saber grind is uh, to those who make them? It's raw strength. It has so much strength, and it's unless it's like a machete or even like a machete. I've done hollows on machetes, and uh, so far they've uh, you know held up fine. Um, I think it's for swords pretty much. I think it's a good grind for swords. But a lot of the older swords, uh, you know, in history, uh, they were full flat too. So I, it's a preference, I guess. I for my my particular preferences, it doesn't really make sense uh, for especially for EDC fixed blades because you want to have cutting performance with you know somewhat durability at the uh, tip. You do quite a, a range. Like to, you were just um, as Jim was scrolling, we saw tomahawks. We saw that. Um, sort of multifaceted uh dagger you know it's it looks kind of like a gladius up front yeah and and that then there is a full custom that one was. and then there's that persian over on the right hand side with the with the top edge i've i've drooled over that multiple times um i i love double-edged anything pretty much and then especially if it's asymmetrical i love daggers but an asymmetrical double grind is just you know and then you see a sort of karambit style ring ring knife there. Um, <laughs> what is the difference? Not what is the difference, but when you make like say a tomahawk, uh, you have an order for a tomahawk, and then you have an order for for one of these compound ground tantos, and then you have that sort of uh, gladius style dagger. How, do you work on those all at the same time? Yes. Yep. It keeps it interesting. If I was doing the same knife. Uh, for example, Alex uh, Steingraber, another mm -hmm. maker that I really uh, you know love his work. Yeah. I want to get one of his fist blades. Um, he does the same things, and I don't know how he does it because I would go insane doing that. Uh, yeah, I got to switch stuff up. And uh, in each batch, I'll have you know compound grinds, double hollows, flats. It's all different stuff. And sometimes I mess up and do the wrong grind on something, and then I'll try to my best to correct it, get right with the customer. But I definitely do mess up. But uh, I try my best. Yeah, uh, Alex Steingraber. I think where he gets the uh, the spice of life or the variety is using the different steels and the heat yeah. trucks on yes. the same design. Yeah. yeah, I think that is it. Okay, so you you've profiled the blade, you've put on the the main bevels, and uh, 
then comes the heat treat. To me, that is the most mysterious uh, and specialized knowledge in the whole process. I can I can get the mechanics, even if I can't do it with my hands, but I can get the mechanics of everything up until that point. And then it's like mystery. It's kind of like tying your own bow tie. Yeah, or it's it's like the uh, soul of the knife, basically, because you can't see it, but you, you have a, you know, it could be there, but I guess for some people. I think it's there. But uh, yeah, so it's the soul of the knife, basically. So how do you go about that, and what kind of equipment do you use? I use an even heat kiln and uh, a cryo uh, canister, uh, which is liquid nitrogen, negative uh, 300 degrees about. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, the different steels, everything gets cryoed unless it doesn't fit my canister, so I am limited by that, which the tomahawks don't get cryogenically heat treated. But the, uh, all the fixed blades do. Um, yeah. It's, uh, All right. you know, what is that benefit of cryo? A uh, couple of um, recent uh, knives I've gotten brag that on the on the blade. D2, cryo, cryo D2. And I'm like, it's like, yeah, what does that mean? Basically, it, you know, simplify it. I'm not very uh, learned in metallurgy or anything like that. It makes the grain finer. And by making the grain finer, you can get a higher hardness while uh, remaining tough. And uh, corrosion resistance is uh, increased. So uh, just for example, the Miller Bros Z-Wear that they use, uh, from what I've learned, they don't tell people what their heat treat is. A lot of guys don't. Uh, they don't cryo, from what I know. Um, and it rusts uh, pretty easily compared to Z-Wear that I heat treat, or someone else heat treats, but uses a cryogenic heat treatment and uh, a low temper temperature. So uh, there's lots of different things in there. It can get very complicated really quick, especially with the different steels. And that temper makes it uh, tough, right? That temper gives it yes. some flex. Yep. Yeah. So after the quench, it's, you know, very hard, not quite glass hard, depending on what steel you use. And then uh, it will go in cryo from my process. And then I'll, I'll leave it overnight. So it's around over 12 hours of cryogenic heat treat. Uh, and then I'll take it out in the morning, let it thaw out a little bit, and then I'll throw it in the uh, kiln for tempering, which goes on for two and a half hours, two times minimum. Sometimes if it has a warp, I'll have to do it longer to uh, correct those warps. So you're saying they stay in the even heat kiln after it's cryogenically treated for two hours or so? Yes, for the temper. Yep. Okay. Two and a half hours about. Yeah. So on your on your website it says that you use steels from fifty two one hundred, which is a, a high carbon steel, uh, all the way to the to the powder metallurgy steels. You know the the higher yes. end. Um, <laughs> first of all, that's an incredible range to me. I, you, uh, like that seems to include a lot of steels with a lot of different properties and characteristics. Um, do you have one that you prefer and and? Do you have one that you prefer to work with? Ease, like easy wise, ADCRV2 is a great steel to work with for stock removal. It's uh, you don't really need to forge it. I, some people get mad at me saying that, but um, it's a great steel. It's a solid steel. Uh, very easy to treat. Uh, straightforward. You don't need cryo, but uh, obviously I do it. Um, but on the higher end, uh, I like Zwear a lot. Crewwear, those two steels, they're the best in my opinion for just overall performance with a good heat treat. Um, they're just solid performers in pretty much every division. Tool steels is the pinnacle in my opinion, but that's again, a personal thing. Well, I have a, uh, I, I got a Steingraber Shark in crew wear and it's my first crew wear and uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. But, but I don't know if it's just that it's an amazing grind on the blade. I mean, you know, Alex can can really grind a blade quite yeah, thin, sure. or if um, or if what I'm really experiencing is the is the quality of the steel. And as as we mentioned, you know that the heat treat is on point. Um, what do you think about what what about crew wear should I be loving and looking for? Uh, the edge retention. Uh, so I don't I'm not sure exactly sure what uh, HRC Alex runs in that, mm -hmm. but um, you can run crew wear at a Pretty high HRC, and it's still very uh, tough. 
which is uh, something that you know is hard to find in a lot of states. So you know, and you know, with the high HRC it becomes uh, you know, cut stuff for a long term, which is nice, less sharpening, All more right. cutting. More cutting. So speaking of more cutting, the the CKK seems to be something new. I don't remember seeing that before. Um, before yeah, recently, added, that's, added your that kitchen, recently. that's your yep. kitchen. That's your kitchen knife. Uh, tell us why you went into that, and and the 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 uh, the specific challenges of making a kitchen knife. So uh, I I went into it because a lot of these models on the on my website are just from demand. So I get I'm getting so many custom orders for a design that's so similar that I basically you know mash them all together and then make something into a model just so it simplifies things for me. So someone can go to the website and then pick, okay, I want this, and then uh, you know, fill out a form and then send it my way, and then I know exactly what to cut out. I don't have to sketch for them or anything like that. It just makes it a little bit easier for me. But the kitchen knife itself, I mean, in, in particular, that seems like a, a, a different beast in a way because a kitchen knife has to flex a little bit. A kitchen knife seems like it, it's a... Uh, another kind of challenge uh, beyond. It, yeah, it definitely is. The uh, full flat grinds, I struggle with them to this day uh, to get it because it's, it's one eighth, uh, one eighth stock, 0 0.94, 0 0.094. Uh, so it's very thin. And the thinner the steel, for me personally, I think other people would agree, uh, the thinner the steel, the harder it is to grind, get everything consistent because you have less material to work with. And if you make a mistake, you can't really correct it as easily. If there's you know a quarter inch worth of steel to work with so uh yeah so the full flat grinds are you know a pain in the ass to get you know straight and uh even so i try my best but there's definitely defects if you look close on the uh kitchen knife especially camp kitchen knife so it's not a full bread kitchen knife so it's you know like an in-between more like a oh. big pairing knife sort of Right, right. CKK, right. Uh, yeah, because a fully flat ground, that's why I was saying before, it seems to me like a very difficult grind because um, in cross section, you know, it's got to be like a perfect triangle with a center line and all that. Yeah. And uh, oh, this thing is beautiful, though. It reminds me a bit of a of a sax, sax knife. Sure. Yeah. It looks like that. Yeah, that is that is a uh, pretty sweet and it comes with a sheath. So, you know, you could go out and do night maneuvers and then come home and cook everyone a meal. Sure. Uh, so the uh, uh, fully custom knives, you mentioned that um, a guy comes with you, uh, comes to you with a design and says, will you make this for me? Is that, is that what you mean by that? Yeah, pretty much. They'll come with me with, you know, I've, I've done a lot of weird stuff. I think I have a, a sketch here. Oh, something that's very odd it's like a pistol grip yeah uh, and you know a lot of i'll do a lot of weird uh designs but yeah you, they come to me with a design uh sometimes it's just you know what will tell me you know what they have in mind so it's not even a sketch or anything and then i'll try to put that on paper uh with my style um of what i you know of my grind lines and all that stuff Mm -hmm. And then I'll proof it with them. So I'll send it to them and then they'll take a look at it. And if they like it, then we uh, proceed and agree with the price. Uh, yeah, then we move on from there. And then it just progresses basically like a normal model from there. So all the custom is done before I even grind custom work. So do you have any um, idea or indication of what the knives that you're making are, how they're being carried, what they're being used for, and who's carrying them? Uh, sort of from just from, you know, stories that people tag me in and stuff. Um, the majority, I, I think, carry them, you know, somewhat like I do. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my customers are around my age, too, which is uh, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more like friends uh, than actual clients, but they're great. So in the four short years you've been doing this, do you feel like um, do you feel like knives have become more? This is going to sound like a ridiculous question, but more mainstream in terms of like, I, I swear, I feel like uh, in the short period of time I've been doing this podcast that I noticed more pocket clips in more pockets. And, and, and I've always been keyed into it. I've always been a knife junkie. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say the same words. 
if you're paying attention to it you see it but yeah yeah i think forge and fire is the biggest thing that alex Steele, all the big guys uh they've grown in popularity a lot uh but i, I think most of it especially in america is because of uh, the tv a lot of people watch tv and uh especially with making a lot of new makers from you know forge and fire just watching it and wanting to do it but uh, yeah I mean, greatest show on TV, if you ask me, and maybe if you ask a lot of people, uh, I think I think there's a maybe a portion of people who think it's it's not good because it's TV, and you know how people like to be. Like, I was way into knives before it was on TV, but sure. um, but I've learned a lot about the process, at least of forging. And uh, you know, my wife and I watch it. Uh, funny thing, we used to watch Project Runway way back in the day, which was kind of the same show, except they. It was a bunch of fashion designers making clothing. You know, I used to work in that industry a long time ago, uh, shooting video. And uh, I was like, baby, someone needs to make this show except about knives. And I was like, yeah, that'll never happen. And then boom, when Forge and Fire, I swear, I was like, man, who's reading my mind here? And uh, man, what a, what a, so good to turn that, uh, turn the TV on and see that happening. People yeah. making stuff yeah. and making knives. Yeah. Definitely refreshing in this uh, era so swords do you do swords i've done the longest blade i've done i'm kind of limited by my kiln mm -hmm. uh was i think 14 inches long if i remember correctly so uh not too long uh hopefully one day i can get i ordered another kiln but it's even smaller than what i got here so i can temper but um uh hopefully one day i can do swords uh, but I might probably will do uh, folders before swords. Okay, so what about folders? Is that something? Uh, is that something that every fixed blade maker um, decides at some point they have to do? Did you set out with with folders in mind and say, "Well, I'll start with fixed blades"? Yeah, no, never. I always fixed blades, and I will never not make fixed blades. You can write that down. I'm definitely <laughs> never not making fixed blades. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I would carry my own folder to be honest. I just like fixed blades so much. I love the reliability. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, but you know, some people they can't uh, you know, carry a fixed blade. So uh, I would love to get into folders, but I don't want to just jump into it and make a titanium mm -hmm. frame lock that everyone else makes. I I rather do something hopefully that's uh, you know a little bit unique. I would say that that's 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 a wise idea because uh, you know unless it is a barn burner. You know, it could get lost, but yeah. you know, you're 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 already kind of making yourself a spot with your EDC fixed blades, and that's a great place to start and a great place to grow out of, especially if you're if you plan to do something like making folders. But I got to say, uh, you know, uh, I was speaking with someone on this show who's a uh, I'm not going to say his name, uh, but he was a fixed blade maker and. Um, specializes in fixed blades that kind of look like they're older. And uh, he was very hesitant about getting into folding knives and then had an idea of how to make one that kind of ran with his style. It wasn't like, oh, well, since everyone's doing a frame lock flipper out of titanium, that's what I got to do to stay afloat. And, and I respected that. Yeah, for sure. Yep. So regrinds, you do regrinds too? I oh, yeah, tons of us. Uh, yeah. Uh, it can get tiring sometimes. How many I do of those? Uh, yes, on hinders, I I've done so many knives. I you know I lose count. So uh, is, is yeah. that a big part of your business? And is it a? It seems like it's it's not the greatest, most fun thing. It's it's very nerve you know nerve wracking because sometimes I'm working on five hundred dollar knives and I have to sell like four knives if I mess this up to you know pay this guy back or you know buy him another one or something like that. Sometimes it's limited edition stuff that, you know, mm -hmm. can't be bought again. Uh, so it's very nervous and I don't charge a lot um, just because I, I don't, I don't think, because it doesn't take a whole lot of time. It's around like 45 minutes. I did a live stream not too long ago of uh, me re grinding the whole process live and uh, it doesn't take too long. So I, I charge $55 right now for a regrind pretty much on any knife, you know, depending on the size, but most of it is folder regrinds. 
So do you do uh, do you offer the same wide range of grinds that you offer in your in your fixed blade knives for regrinds? Like if I sent you a a, a hinderer Bowie, which I'm not going to because I can't replace it either. But if I were to send you a hinderer Bowie and say make this a compound hollow uh, hollow Bowie, is that something you would consider? Not anymore. I used to, but I didn't wasn't liking the way they were turning out with the uh, the compound grinds. I need it. It's part of my equipment. Uh, I need a smaller uh, wheel for the hollow grinds All to right, get gotcha. a more defined look. I just didn't like how they looked. They looked like washed out, and it, it just didn't. I didn't like the look of it. So I stopped all, offering that. So for regrinds, I offer uh, full flats and then uh, just a hollow grind on regrinds. So I want to talk a little bit as we, as we uh, as we come into the station here. I want to talk about your business and how you um, how you want it to grow. I mean, I, most people naturally kind of uh, you know you're obviously an ambitious individual, and ambition grows as you as you feed it. Uh, is this something uh, you want to see grow uh, into? Uh, do you want to be bringing other people in? Do you want to collaborate with custom, I mean, with uh, production companies? I probably never collaborate with a production company just because it's it's not what I like. It's not something I would do. I, I wouldn't want to like sell out. Not not the best word to use, but um, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, I would always re want to remain like hands on. I definitely want to bring someone on eventually. Maybe a, my, one of my brothers. I have three brothers. Um, maybe one of them. Uh, but if they don't want to, uh, I would definitely look to hire someone. Uh, I didn't think it would get this far when I was 17. I uh, didn't think I would be doing it and making this much money that I am. But uh, just seeing how it progresses, um, I have uh, I went to school for welding, so I have something to fall back on if uh, all of a sudden people don't like my work anymore. Well, it's interesting that you say sell out because I was like, ah, that, to me, that's not selling out. No, and I'm not. And like I, I said, well, that was the wrong word. Well, no, no, no. But I, I'm I'm a Gen Xer, and and you know, in the '80s and '90s, everyone was talking about selling out. You know, like if you sold five CDs, oh man, you sold. I yeah. was way into them before they sold five CDs. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but it's interesting because right now it wouldn't make sense with what you with what your operation is and what you charge for a knife. If you were to have, say, Fox Knives or um, whomever make a make a version of your knife they'd be charging more than you do and it makes yeah. no sense it makes no sense for you right now uh i i do like the idea of those collaborations because they can get custom knives into the hands of people who can't afford them but right for now sure. yeah right for now sure. your mission is to put them in the hands of people so yeah from yeah from the maker to the hands directly not have some middleman and uh you know not have it made in china or some foreign place right have it made in america so uh, if you're to bring your brothers in or any other individuals to help you uh, with your, uh, you know, work and to, and to up your production, would you be over them constantly? No, that's not how I do it. No, that's not good enough. How would that work? Um, they would have to learn uh, quite a bit. It took me uh, probably uh, three years to get to even something that was, you know, somewhat decent. Uh, you can look back at my timeline. My older knives are not too uh, too great, and right now I'm still working to get better. But um, yeah, they would have, definitely have to learn a lot. They wouldn't be selling any knives anytime soon that they were making. But uh, the more basic processes they can do, uh, you know, with little input from me, just to get started. So cutting it out and uh, you know stuff like that. The bevels are the most uh, crucial and the hardest to do. Are they also knife guys? Uh, no, no, uh, none of them really. They're not like they, you know, most of them carry a knife every day. I won't say one of them, uh, right. for sure. But uh, yeah, they're not like knife guys at, at what I was into, not at all. Right to the uh, the state that I was into when I was you know getting into. Okay, so you mentioned before you're not uh, you don't consider yourself an artistic guy. I have established that you are. Because you make knives and you and they're beautiful, uh, but if you weren't making knives, but you were making something else, I'm not asking. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about your welding uh, or your fallback job. But what would you be making if you weren't making knives? If, if you could have your druthers and you could do whatever you wanted, 
Uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, Nice is pretty much it. Um, Building firearms would be cool. Uh, That's another thing that, you know, really intrigues me. Machining stuff, that would be firearms. Uh, Dyes and just metal. I I like metal a lot. It's never let me down. (laughs) <laughs> have you what else have you built in metal have you built anything else in metal uh but like weird things welding just you know sculptures if you would call it that I don't know, oh sculptures <laughs> it, it wasn't really you know anything that should be called a sculpture but yeah just weird stuff most aren't yeah <laughs> so uh where do people buy your knives how, do, how should people get in touch with you to get behind the wheel of a bgm knife uh, what, what I would say is whatever's easier for you, Instagram or emails is primarily. But you, you, people give me a call too. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, you know, open any pretty much any time of the day to, you know, answer phone calls and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I prefer the most, if you want to make me happy, uh, emails, S- sending uh, an order form. It just makes it the easiest for me. There's less back and forth. I can look what you want and then I can tell you, you know, what I have in stock for handle colors and stuff like that okay and 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 one last thing here uh describe what your dream knife is uh that you would that you could make that's beyond your capabilities right now what would that look like and what would it be made out of uh well i guess because it's a brand new steel but uh magna cut it'd probably be using that steel I, i plan on getting some of that to mess around with but uh Maybe a slightly altered uh, spade design, just a little more fancy. Maybe a compound ground version of it. Something so like that, that that magna cut steel. That's the that's the steel that um, knife steel nerds. Um, uh, oh my gosh, why is his name? His name escapes me at the at this moment. Uh, but that that was created by. I have his book oh, and I can't oh, remember his name. Either. No, 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 no. Oh my gosh! It's only because I'm trying to think of it, yeah. and uh, and I'm approaching an old age. But uh, yeah, um, Thomas. Oh God. Laren. Think, well, Thomas. Laren, Laren Thomas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew his last name. I couldn't get the <laughs> first. Thank you and thank you, Jim. Yeah, Laren. It was his first name that got me. Uh, yeah, what a what an interesting guy and what a deep knowledge of steel. So Magna Cut. A magna cut spade with with compound grinds. That that sounds just about right to me. Yeah, I think that would be neat. All right. Oh, actually, I do have one more question. What what can we expect from you next? Like, what what design are you working on? What do you what do you have in the offing? Uh, that new steel. The two things that I'm trying to work towards, besides building up a new set of tools in the shop so I can have someone else help me is uh, the magna cut steel. I want to get a good heat treatment done with that and start using that and having it as an option on the website. It's pretty expensive. So it probably be 10 to 15 bucks, maybe 20 uh, more than the crew wear that I'm using, which is the top uh, steel that I'm using right now. Um, yeah. And, and uh, tomahawks is the other thing. Uh, hopefully summer I can get um, some water jet and uh, have them available to order. I want to do a different couple of uh, designs too. So those tomahawks, uh, the ones that you make right now, they're all cut out of one piece of steel. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. Kind of like they're a, water jet. Okay. I done a couple customs uh, and uh, cut them out by hand, which is a pain in the ass on the bandsaw <laughs> and the uh, angle grinder. Uh, and uh, one of them I used, or I think two I've used quarter inch steel, which you know another pain in the ass because it's thicker oh, and takes. Gosh. A lot more, you know, abrasives and bandsaw blades to work through. But right. normally they're a 316 stack, which I think is a decent compromise because they're not too big. It's a small one, right? Just so it can fit in my kiln and stuff like that. Right. And there is a difference between a tomahawk and a hatchet, right? Tomahawk is more of a fighting thing. A hatchet is more of a uh, wood woodland thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you can, you know, Definitions probably uh, depends who you ask for sure. Yeah, the definitions. Well, John, it's been a pleasure meeting you and talking about BGM knives. I'm uh, really impressed with the work you do, and um, you uh, uh, you know we'll be talking offline and uh, about about knives that will end up in my cabinet here at home. Um, 
but I, I applaud you for tackling the EDC fixed blade uh, thing. It's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy, there are a lot of considerations that go into it that don't go into a belt knife. So uh, it's, it's to me uh, uh, a noble pursuit and definitely one that uh, I think more and more people are catching up on the pocket, the pocket fixed blades, the small scouts carry fixed blades and uh, you know, the way you're doing is is killing it. So thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie. Thank podcast. you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Take care. Take care. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR, 13MOV, and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. <laughs> Probably worse. Uh John, uh, with his wide range of designs, grinds, and materials, and all that, uh, I, I, you know, I think he's in a perfect position, and and a young man, he's in a great position uh, to grow BGM knives into you know whatever he wants it to be. Uh, me personally, I hope he sticks with the uh, EDC fixed blade game for a while because, uh, well, he seems passionate about it. Uh, but so am I, and. Uh, there's a lot to explore there with his work, including the Tomahawks, which if you ask me, I got the definition just right. So uh, John Miller, there he goes, BGM Knives. Check him out on Instagram and also on YouTube. Help his channel take off. He said he wasn't getting much traction, uh, but that live stream of him doing the regrind uh, was really cool. So I think uh, he's got a future on YouTube too. Uh, Check, come join us next week for another great interview here on the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, it's, it's my favorite thing that we do here, uh, getting to talk and meet with uh, people just like John. So join us next week. All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast mm -hmm.